Aloha and welcome to Crossroads in Learning. I am your host, Keisha King. Uh, we have conversations here that are real and relevant. Today is no different. Thank you for joining us on Courageous Conversations with Black Men. Joining us today are three local wonderful men who are going to share a little bit about their organizations and what they're doing. Our goal here today is to add another tidbit of information to the narrative that's going on about race, systemic racism, and police brutality and all the like. So I will allow them to introduce themselves. We'll start with you, Stephen. Uh, how's everybody doing? Uh, my name is Stephen Hill, and uh, I consider myself new to the island still, but I've been here for about two years working on Magnum PI. Uh, and I play the role of TC uh, Theodore Calvin and um, just having a ball, just living my dream and uh, happy to be here. Wonderful. It's a wonderful thing to be able to say you're living your dream. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from Howard. Hi, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to Keisha for uh, hosting this uh, wonderful event here. Uh, my name is Howard Covington. I'm originally from Dallas, Texas. I've been here in Hawaii for about 14 years now. I retired from the military after 25 years here in the military. Um, I am here representing uh, the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Hawaii, uh, Free and Accepted Masons here in Hawaii as their president. And I've uh, been a Mason for about 26 years now. 26 years is somebody's lifetime. So congratulations <laughs> and thank you for that. Lastly, we'll hear from Nathaniel. Can we call you Nate? You can call me Nate. I hope you do. <laughs> uh, Nathaniel is a government name that uh, I only have to put on paper sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, my name is Nate Dixon. Uh, I am currently employed by the Department of Defense. I'm the uh, air traffic manager over at the uh, Kalilo Airport in uh, Kapolei. I, like Carol, uh, uh, Howard, uh, retired from the military after 22 years. Uh, I've been here on the island for about 17 years now. Uh, so this is going to you know, be my uh, retirement location. But uh, at the same time, I, I am a member of Prince Hall and uh, his jurisdiction. So we have something in common there as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for being here. As I said earlier, we like to have conversations that are real and relevant. However, this one takes courage. It takes courage to, first of all, it takes courage and a lot of strength just to be an African-American male in America where most times you are hated on simply because of the color of your skin and not the content of your character. So the fact that you all um, do it and do it well and have found success. I applaud you. And the whole purpose of this show is to honor you for the things that you are currently doing within your organizations. So right now with all that's happening with race in America, there's a call for our allies to step in. And we've heard terms like white privilege, use your white privilege to help to educate and to support um, Black people all over. But before we can ask for anyone else to help us, in which we do need sometimes help, we want to kind of honor and talk about what we are doing to help ourselves. So actually, Howard, I'd like to start with you and pose that question. What do you see as the role of Black men in helping ourselves defeat systemic racism and ra uh, racial disparities. And we want to start with someone, Howard, uh, perhaps you, and have an open discussion. Right, uh, Keisha, uh, excellent question. I believe the role of the Black man right now is to be able to help to educate, you know, not only ourselves and our fellow Black men, but our counterparts as to uh, what it is that we are experiencing and how we experience those things. Uh, and we have to be able to have the conversation with our non, uh, our non Blacks because uh, they may say, oh, I, I grew up in poverty too. 
but even if you grew up in poverty, you did your poverty uh, experience probably wasn't the same as mine because every day when you went out the house, you didn't have to worry about uh, if you were going to come home that day. You know what I'm saying? If mm-hmm. if uh, if you were going to get stopped on the side of the road for something that just for hanging out with your fellas or your your friends or playing basketball at the park. So there is a difference in uh, a living condition versus a, a actual uh, social disparity that uh, our African American men are going through. Mm. Uh, and so our role should be to be able to educate and have, the, like we're doing now, have an open dialogue to be able to uh, speak freely, so that they have an understanding of, you know, exactly what it feels like. Uh, when something is done or said, or if we get stopped, how does that how how does that feel to me when I wasn't doing anything? You mm. know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would anyone else like to add to that? What is the role of the black man um, in helping ourselves to defeat systemic racism? I think the most important thing is education. You know, we, we have a tendency to to just uh, go by what we were taught in high school and college or whatever. And that's not the true history of this country mm-hmm. and us as a black people. So mm-hmm. it's incumbent upon us to educate ourselves mm-hmm. the things that the systematic racism that are in place and the reason why those uh, systems are in place. Uh, so the most important thing I think that we can do as a black man is to direct our, our, our younger brothers who generally are more interested in us than are in educating themselves on, on black history as it, it stands. Because I know personally, um, I did not gain knowledge of the true history of black people until I was in my 40s or 50s Mm. because I accepted what was taught to me. Mm -hmm. I never challenged that. I never dug deeper to find out exactly, you know, what it was or who I am or where I'm from and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is, is, is brought about because of technology. So now we have a lot of things that are available to us that we didn't have several years ago. So, mm-hmm. you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have computers and we didn't have Google. So we, mm-hmm. we could see mm-hmm. things. But uh, right now, the, the younger people are actually, you know, uh, thirsting for knowledge. And, and all we can do is just support them. Okay. So support and education. Stephen, would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, quote a hermetic philosophy of as above, so below. Um, and kind of translate that into um, the microcosm and the macrocosm, right? Okay. And mm-hmm. I feel like during times like this, I see a, a lot of like sweeping gestures. Everyone wants to do something really big. Everyone mm-hmm. wants to to effect change on the macro level. Um, mm-hmm. But the micro level is just as important. Um, I find that now that I'm on a show that has so many millions of viewers, even um, Mm -hmm. I'm still doing the same small work that I was doing before I got on this show. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's just as important to uh, educate in small, very small groups. I I think um, I I was thinking back to a woman named Chauncey. Uh, I don't remember her last name, but I remember I was a kid and I was lazy. And I didn't want to learn. And uh, over the summer, she was she was my aunt's best friend, but she was also an educator. And she would come and she taught me. She would make me sit down. I wasn't allowed to go outside until <laughs> she made me uh, she made me um, pronounce all those words that I couldn't pronounce. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. she helped me out. And I remember her giving me a a book when I was way too young to read it. I should go back and read it now. But uh, I was reading, um, they came before the Mayflower. 
And mm. uh, she gave me that in like the fourth grade. That was, <laughs> that was way too early to give me that book. I couldn't pronounce most of the words in the book, but um, I think it's all about, uh, it's okay to, to do something by talking to just one kid in your neighborhood mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. on your floor or, you know, in your class or a, a family member. Um, I don't think everything has to be uh, a million man march level event for mm -hmm. us to exact change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good point. And uh, I would ask then, what is it that you're doing? If one person can help affect change with one person, what are you doing to do that yourselves? That's for all of you. Well, for me, uh, one of the things I've done is I've, I've I've joined the uh, Boys and Girls Club. I'm the president for the board of the Boys and Girls Club here in Ever Beach. And uh, it's, it was funny that uh, Nate called me and said, hey, we're looking for someone to sit on this panel to talk about uh, Black Lives Matter. So tomorrow I have the same conversation with three graduating students, uh, two young men and one female and we'll be asking questions and talking to them about, you know, these same tough questions, you know, how are they being impacted um, by this whole situation around them? And mm -hmm. uh, I, was, I had the opportunity to speak with them a little bit last week just to get to know them and they're very intelligent. And one of them is on their way to the Navy. The other one has a scholarship to go to, uh, I think, North Texas or something. But uh, the fact that uh, they live here in Hawaii and they are being, you know, they don't know what it looks like to be uh, racially uh, disfranchised against. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They don't know what that looks like. So someone here in Hawaii may be, uh, may have said something that was racially motivated to them and they didn't know it. They didn't know what to do. They just probably thought, oh, this person said something that I didn't like, mm -hmm. but it was a racial comment. Mm -hmm. And so in preparing them and preparing their minds to understand that when they leave here, Hawaii, this is the, this is the place where it's kind of like uh, a sheltered life almost, you know, Thank because you. we don't always get hit with the, with the, the Rodney Kings, the Emmett Tills, mm -hmm. the Breonna Taylors, mm -hmm. the George mm -hmm. Floyds over here, but we mm -hmm. see them. Mm -hmm. They have an insecurity about going to the mainland and understanding mm -hmm. it. It's our responsibility to prepare them to understand how to, to insert themselves into that community and not lose you know, themselves. Mm -hmm. well, I want to interrupt you and say, you're right. We do live somewhat in a bubble. We are aware of what's happening. But when you're watching something from a distance and you're not fully experiencing it, then you really don't fully understand until you're there. So when you guys mention education, does the education that you are providing include what that looks like? Like, do you give them instant, and I'm getting ahead of myself in questions, but we're gonna touch on police brutality uh, just to say, does your education really help them if they get pulled over by the police? Are you teaching behaviors? Are you teaching de-escalation um, of temperament? Uh, what does that look like? And how are we achieving that goal? Anyone? Now, Ella, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, Grant. Oh, well, I, I was going to say, um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, one thing that I have been doing myself is uh, I do therapy. Um, and uh, I just want to mention that because I think it's a bit of a stigma attached to it in, in the black community as opposed as it, it relates to black men specifically. So um, me as a, as a black man, I want to say that it's, it's amazing. I actually have a brother that I talk to. We, 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 uh, we meet on Wednesdays and um, I have a great conversation. Actually, Thursdays we have, we have a great conversation, and um, it's just nice to have uh, an older black man to talk to to get things off off my chest. So 
um, if I could pass that on as an education piece to anybody, um, I would say to, to seek out therapy and, and that's okay. You know, it's not something that should be, you should be shamed to do, you know, right. just reach out. Right. You touched on something that is at the very core of what we experience in uh, African-American communities is that there must be something wrong that person is touched or special or what have you if they attend therapy, but that is not the case. Therapy is a tool that is used by many to help us get through all of the different things that we face. Um, just watching the violence that's taking place with what's going on with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, as was mentioned, is a type of trauma because you're watching, this is not a video game. Uh, Steven, no slide to you or shade to you, but this mm -hmm. is not an acting moment. This is not an action movie. This is actually someone's life. And so when we are watching that, it does cause trauma, post-traumatic stress um, and things of that nature. So therapy is good and I applaud you for going. Um, I think it's important and thank you for sharing that aspect of education. So well, quick, yeah. quickly, just to, to piggyback on what you said, um, the first time I ever took therapy was I was in the acting class, you know, it was very early on in my career and, uh, my acting coach, she said, you know, acting is not therapy. And I didn't know what she meant because it felt like therapy to me. Um, but it wasn't until I was on my way home one night on the train on the way from downtown to uptown in, in Manhattan. And uh, I just started to sob uncontrollably because she had in class helped me uncover feelings that I had for something that I had never dealt with. So um, yes, it is, it is trauma. We're walking around with trauma that's going on right now in, in modern day, but we also in our DNA, uh, we have trauma that we carry of our ancestors, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of this stuff that's going on is just reactivating that, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. we're dealing with our trauma and their trauma. So mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I was told by uh, uh, a shaman of, of sorts here, he said that, you know, I can help the trauma of the, 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 my people, my ancestors in the past, because they weren't in a place where they could deal with it. So mm -hmm. us um, being able to uh, jump in and do therapy now is extremely <laughs> powerful. I love that. You're exactly right. I want to describe it, if I may, as uh, being on a boat and you have a wake, a big wave that comes up behind the boat, right? Just because a group of people get off the boat doesn't mean the wake isn't going to come and still shake things up and have an effect. And that's exactly what it's like for anyone and their ancestors that have been through the challenges, but especially Black folks and slavery. We are still dealing with the wake of it all. And as you so appropriately said, it is in our DNA. So again, a way to educate yourself is to seek therapy and um, talk to someone who is, like you mentioned, older, wiser, with more experience, and qualified to help and to support in that effort. Um, when we talk Father about... Keisha, yes, sir? Keisha, I, I mean, I, I hope I'm going to understand the analogy you just used about the wave and the ship, and mm -hmm. some people get off. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to make sure that, I mean, I think that it's important that, you know, that we, you know, if we want to you know, overcome this, that we stay part of that ship that's being rocked, you know what I'm saying, and mm -hmm. help stabilize it. Because if we if we just get off, then we miss a whole lot of things, a whole lot of opportunities to put things in our favor. Does that make yes. sense? Yes, sir. I think I was trying to say that just because the slave masters are gone doesn't mean right. that the effects of slavery are gone. Just exactly. because they've gotten off the boat, just because they've... Um, they're no longer with us doesn't mean that the problem itself is over. No, the after effects are still there exactly. for all of us. So yeah. we need to stay and fight and, and be a part of, this is our mission, you know? Right. We just started another mission that I never even thought of because, mm -hmm. you know, PTSD has been a, a, a thing that's brought about because of wars that we started, not we started, but they started. 
that we were mm-hmm. participating in, and mm-hmm. it's become a part of the new recovery process. They never thought about the recovery process for us 400 years ago, but that right. that 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 uh, uh, PTSD that we've got and continue to have, based on not just what our ancestors endured, but we're during enduring at this point in our lives is something that should be a part of that. You know, we talk, you know, recreation, uh, that, that should be one. Cause uh, mm-hmm. I'll tell you, you know, for a black man to think about going to a, a therapist, mm-hmm. it's like putting a gun to his head, you know, and telling him to pull the mm-hmm. trigger. It generally mm-hmm. ain't gonna happen. We mm-hmm. deal with whatever internal issues we have internally. We don't mm-hmm. ask, we don't, women, uh, you know, sometimes have a little bit more of a latitude so that they could go and, and talk to their friends. But generally, men keep whatever issues they have internally and deal with them. Mm-hmm. We are not taught to express our, our feelings mm-hmm. and, and, and our concerns or our issues. And that's something that we need to work on. And when I say... Uh, PTSD, that's that's one avenue. Because, mm-hmm. you know, unless you're taught to do certain things, you're not gonna do it. Mm-hmm. And, and and like I said, we as black men are not taught to go out and, and spill our feelings and 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 uh concerns to someone other than your mother, <laughs> more than likely. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. Anyone want to say anything well, to that? Or I think I think Nate um, Nate, as far as the the therapy piece, uh, the way Stephen put it, I mean, I don't know if it's a professional therapist, but it sounds like you you have someone that you talk to, right? And that could be uh, someone that you're very close to, uh, someone in your uh, organization that you're in that you consider to be a best friend someone that you can just vent these emotions out to, to help you uncover these un, undiscovered feelings that you're harboring about certain things. So it doesn't always have to be in a professional setting of, for therapy. I mean, mm-hmm. this right here is therapeutic, just, oh, you're, just you're, having you're a absolutely conversation, right. you know what right. I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's what we developed over years is our own form of therapy. But it's not necessarily the most beneficial therapy. You know, when you talk to your friends about something, you're talking about commonality and and and, and they can't think outside the box. Sometimes you need to go and get and seek that professional help. So yeah. uh, like I said, I, I personally have never been through a to a therapist. Um and, and one because of my job and 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 uh, you know, I'd have to question, I mean, uh, answer for that but just the thought of spilling my guts to somebody i didn't know Mm -hmm. was foreign to me Mm -hmm. so it's not something that i would look forward to doing Mm -hmm. so i would i would uh to me not going to get the therapy could be more detrimental to your uh you're absolutely that's i'm I'm not going to going and getting it I'm not denying. Actually, I'm accepting that. I'm yeah. what I'm saying yeah. is because I don't is because I am the way that I am. Whereas if I saw help, it could make a difference. And I'm I'm using me as the example, but I'm just mm-hmm. saying black people in general do not go out and seek help. They just right. deal with their inner demons. Are you willing? Are you willing to? So this like is said, turning now. into a therapy session right now. Stephen, I'm going to let you go ahead and say your point, and then we're going to switch gears okay. a little bit. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I just wanted to uh, to piggyback on something that Howard said about the uh, the boat and getting off. And uh, whenever we, at least whenever I'm having discussions about slavery, you know, you often hear people uh chime in with what they would have done during slavery or what they wouldn't have done during slavery i, mm-hmm. I wouldn't i wouldn't have been i wouldn't have done no da, 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 da. you know we don't even uh-huh. think that a lot of them brothers and sisters didn't even there were no paved roads back then you know they were right. you know they didn't even have shoes you know running right. was 
definitely, you know, you ever just walk on the, if I walk on the beach, my tender New York feet with, <laughs> with no shoes on. <laughs> and listen, so, you know, um, I think, I think it's one, th one of the things I hear people always say is, you know, I probably would have been one of the slaves to jump off the boat. I wouldn't, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have even made it here, you know, but I, I just want to say that like, you know, we are the descendants of survivors of yes. people that didn't jump off the boat. We stayed on the mm -hmm. boat. We stayed mm -hmm. on the boat. We got here. We stayed alive and we kept living. We kept going mm -hmm. and kept living. So that DNA mm -hmm. that we have is still living. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the things that they couldn't do, we can do now. They mm -hmm. couldn't think about some slavery, you know, but I, mm -hmm. I, I mean, not slavery. They couldn't think about uh, uh, therapy. Uh, therapy. Right. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I would imagine that if uh, Harry Tubman came and got you and said, come on, let's go. You know, that trip would be a hell of a therapy session. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. By the time Indeed. you get to Philadelphia Indeed. or wherever she was bringing you, um, you had a therapy session. And when you got there, it was an unlearning of whatever it was that you went through. You know, mm -hmm. and that's a lot mm -hmm. of what therapy is, is just unlearning what we think about ourselves and looking at what it is under a new light. So let's right. take advantage of that. And it's so I would encourage I'm us. Touchable. Yeah, I would encourage us to um, to kind of do some introspection, think about those things. We have not touched the tip of the iceberg and it's time to go, which is why I said this is <laughs> <laughs> this is why I said this is a series, two parts, and uh, we've had some commitment that some of you all will return. We'll add others mm -hmm. to the conversation. The goal is to begin a dialogue, to let people see that it's there are tons of positive Black men in the world who are making a positive impact. Some are, um, I think you have a military background, right, Nate? Yes or no? I do. Right. And Howard, do you? Retired, yes. yes. And then Stephen, you are definitely representing for the I talented played, and creative. I played military on TV. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> I, could, I, could learn, I could learn some of the real deal from these brothers. <laughs> Indeed, and I think that's the yeah. beauty of this entire conversation is that we all learn from each other, uh, no matter what our race, our sexual uh, uh, preference or background or demographic we are, we can all learn from each other and hopefully um, grow and heal, uh, especially now while we have all of these things going on in our country, around the world, and right here in Hawaii. You've been watching Crossroads in Learning. We've been having courageous conversations. I want to thank all of you brothers. I want to say I honor you and I respect you all for all that you are doing and what you represent. You do represent the best of us. And I'm looking forward to the great things you'll continue to do. I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you all for coming to the Crossroads. Aloha. Aloha.